Hello, everyone. Um, we're just going to wait two more minutes because we're still missing one panelist who's searching the room, which is not the easiest Senate, but we'll get started in a sec. She wants it, girl boy, girl boy. But I'm not sure the message is coming through. Oh. Is it not turning off? All right, hello everyone. We're gonna get started and then Ephraim, as soon as he comes in, he's just gonna freestyle and join the conversation. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to talk about the luxury to disconnect. Um, it's basically a conversation around privacy and how to retain an element of choice in a world where technology is basically around us everywhere. So how can we still opt out, have a choice, and that's my thesis, and I've invited the, the panelists um, to challenge me on that assumption and to share personal stories. So it's going to be sort of a journey around the world. I do invite you from the floor to also, when you feel this is a, something you connect to, a story that you have for how you protect your privacy and what strategies and mechanisms you have in order to challenge maybe the cost of protecting your privacy because we're going to talk about the economics of that and how expensive it might be these days um, to actually get better protection, both security and privacy wise, um, then do feel free to give me a sign and jump in. Um, we are being joined today, uh, Solana is actually stepping in very last minute. Solana Lassen is the editor of the Internet Health Report um, at Mozilla. She's stepping in for Julia Kloiber, who is, is a researcher on emerging tech and was unfortunately too sick to travel to Paris, so Solana, very last minute, kindly stepped in. Um, she's an all-rounder. She's going to take a perspective on basically youth and children's education and how to look at it from a privacy and technological change point of view. 
And then we have Sushant, who works for a Software Freedom and Law Center in India. He's a Delhi-based lawyer who's been, and there's the frame, as I said, freestyling in, um, <laughs> um, looking into privacy and data protection, who's going to share a lot from his work in India. There's like we've already started this conversation. We could fill it with this alone. We will try to have personal stories from all over the world. And Ephraim is not going to get the first word, but uh, <laughs> Ephraim works for Article 19 in Kenya, but work covers all of East Africa and is also going to share some of his work on privacy and data protection from that angle. Um, so with that, basically, I'm going to hand it over straight to Solana to kick us off with her personal story of how, has it become a luxury to just connect? Well, I, I think for the purpose of this conversation, I thought I would start with the personal story of how uh, I'm navigating the field of technology with my daughter. Um, I'm a mother, and I have a six-year-old daughter who's beginning to ask when she will get her cell phone. I'm sure that many of you here in the audience face the similar challenges, whether with your own children or nieces and nephews. And if you happen to be the part of your family that is the most aware of the internet, you get asked a lot about what should I do, how should I do this, what's too much, what's too little. And when I think about this question of the, private, the right to disconnect, I always worry about those parts of society that are most vulnerable in other contexts, not just in terms of the internet. We think about women, we think about the poor, and children. Children are vulnerable. Um, whether online or offline. And increasingly, how much we choose to connect our children is something that determines how much they are at risk um, for different bad actors or different companies or different kinds of data sharing that we might not know uh, the extent of the risk of until they are older. Um, and so some of the studies that have been coming out recently on this topic to me, closely resemble the ones that used to come out on access to television. People who are poor and maybe don't have access to as much education or resources or uh, can't have money to have a nanny or somebody to entertain their children, let their kids watch more TV than somebody from an affluent ha household who has other means to uh, entertain the children. And you see similar dynamics coming up with who has most access to technology, at least in wealthy countries where technology is ubiquitous or where people have cell phones, then often what we're finding is that um, in poor urban neighborhoods, the kids will be spending much more time with video games or cell phones than they might even in Silicon Valley households uh, where parents work in technology. And so those kinds of um, reverse digital divides, I think, are an interesting example, one of many, of, of how this issue shows up in different societies. Great. So basically what we're having is outside of the geographical digital divide, we also have a poor and rich within societies of each country. Um, Shashank, do you want to add your perspective to that? Um, yes. Firstly, thank you, Kathleen, for having me and Software Freedom Law Center um, on this panel. We're very privileged. Um, I would like to start by um, if, if any of you don't know about India's biometric, on mass biometric collection uh, program, it's called the Aadhaar. So I will keep mentioning the Aadhaar project so that everyone knows what I'm talking about. Um, I, so the Aadhaar project was initiated by India in 2009, where they plan to take biometric information and demographic information of each and every, each and every person living in India, which is fingerprints, iris scans, and demographic information, to provide them better services and targeted subsidies. My personal story starts, um, I would like to disclaim this, that I am a very privileged member of Indian society, but it even affected me. Um, into in, back in 2017, uh, the Indian government um, previously made it mandatory for tax filings to be linked to your Aadhaar. And back in 2017, when I was filing my, my taxation documents, up until then, I was avoiding linking my information to Aadhaar, the Aadhaar project, but I had to because I didn't want to not file my taxes and default on my taxes. So that's one way of how I was coerced into getting, the, uh, getting into the Aadhaar project and um, how it was linked, linked with my tax, tax documents. Um, one another story I want to share is um, we're, we're lawyers defending digital rights and, and free speech in India. 
one of our clients was recently um, denied a birth certificate for um, his child because they didn't um, own an Aadhaar. So um, this, 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 this ju justifies at what level, and there is no, there is no regulation, no rule, no law uh, mandating um, issuance of birth certificate based on Aadhaar. So we're challenging this. But this goes on to explain how the Indian government is using Aadhaar to penetrate each and every citizen's life. Um, quickly, um, uh, recapping two years of the, the past two years in India where we've had a large debate on privacy and, and after that Aadhaar. Um, back in uh, last year, uh, mid, mid last year, we had the privacy, the Supreme Court declared privacy as a fundamental right for all Indians, which was sort of say the, the pivotal point in the privacy debate in India. Um, the, the Supreme Court said that um, privacy is a matter of dignity, integrity, and a basic human right, which was, um, um, you know, which, which, which was much applauded by, by civil society organizations and the society back home. Um, but a couple of months back, the same court legitimized the Aadhaar project as it was challenged constitutionally on, on the basis of privacy, saying that Aadha, the, the government can make Aadhaar mandatory for giving access to services, benefits, and subsidies, and also link, legitimizing linking with taxation documents. So if you look at India, um, with, with most of the country being poor and relying on some sort of services or subsidies for the government, they are linked with Aadhaar mandatorily, or you're filing tax, tax documents, you are linked with Aadhaar mandatorily, so practically covering the entire population with Aadhaar. Um, having said this, the Indian government and the Indian judiciary especially does have a knack of going back on its own decisions, so we feel that in the coming coming years, they, they, will, um, they will scrap Aadhaar, so to say. But um, what, is, what is important to also quote is, the privacy judgment was a nine-judge nine bench judgment of the Supreme Court, which is, which is very high in our, in our terms. And it, it, has, it had a very wide gamut. It affected um, LGBT rights. Uh, subsequently, after the privacy judgment, um, the LGBT, the, the um, homosexuality was made, Ill, uh, was, was made legal in India. It was struck off as being illegal. It, it targets um, freedom of speech. It targets freedom of food, wh what you want to eat. So the privacy judgment has a very large ambit, and um, it's, it's a very important judgment for, for all, all of us. And it just doesn't affect India, but the globe largely, for um, using that to probably challenge Aadhaar, challenge subsequent methods of mass surveillance famous for. So, yeah, let's stop there. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a very personal story, but it's also a very bleak one, because when we're talking about do we actually still have a choice and is there a way to opt out, I'm not sure that's the case in India, but we will talk about strategies um, later, because we, we try to identify things. Cause what we want you to get out of this, which is also why you're invited to share your stories, is the power of us having the chance to change something because sometimes we just need to be able to actually put ourselves in a mind frame where we can imagine it to get there. So we will try to get there afterwards. But uh, now that Ephraim actually just told me he came straight from the airport. So uh, now that you're totally acc acclimatized to the Parisian <laughs> weather of rain, do you want to share your story also, please? Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen, for um, this conversation. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, our flight delayed from Nairobi, uh, but finally we made it here. Um, so my personal story comes from around 2010, 2011, when uh, in Kenya we just passed a new constitution, and the new constitution required new political parties to be registered. And for you to be registered as a member of a political party, uh, for, for the party to, to be registered, it had to show that you had membership of uh, citizens from all over the country, from every county, um, every um, ward, every constituency. Um, so how did they do this? Some parties, for them to be registered, they had to get data from telco companies, mobile money. Some of you have heard about M-Pesa. Uh, this was a big fight that I used to have back then with, with Safaricom legal team, uh, which finally they resolved. Uh, but back then, the M-Pesa books had your name, your number, your ID, your address, the amount you've withdrawn, the, uh, just basically everything uh, about that transaction beyond just that transaction. They, they didn't have a special code that they 
later changed after a lot of pushback that we've been having since 2010 with them. So you found yourself registered for a political party which maybe you don't ascribe to the values just because you had registered with a telco to uh, work on, to, to, to access mobile money. Mobile money is um, for every 20,000, actually there is there's around 20,000 ATMs in Kenya, compare that with around 600,000 mobile money agents. So that tells you how big um, financial inclusion is linked to, to privacy and data protection. So this for me was a wake up moment, 2010-2011, that hey, we need to work something ar on something around this. So tried having pushback around privacy and data protection, that personal awareness that hey, maybe your family, people close to you were registered in political parties and they're asking you, how do you go about it? You're the only person maybe who've studied law in that family or in that village or, or that community. So you need to, people are asking you, what should we, what should we do about it? Um, so that um, was the personal story. And just copying a lot from India, from the penal code to a lot of things, Kenya, we always copy a lot of things from India to other. Um, we, uh, in 2014, um, the government gave a contract to Safaricom, the biggest telco provider, which is a subsidiary of Vodafone, for those who know Vodafone UK. Um, and um, the, 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 the contract was for them to link uh, surveillance, to have street surveillance cameras across this, and to provide uh, police uh, with a communication network. So one of the pushbacks that we did back then, I was at Access Now, um, and um, before moving to Article 19, in partnership, we tried to m make them uh, try and uh, ensure that the systems are secure and they don't use the same network as they are for the other common users. Um, but then there's been that pushback back then uh, as compared to right now. So uh, it's just a journey. I'll give the journey. From 2014, there was a lot of pushback when you're talking about security and data protection and, pr and privacy. Uh, back then there was pushback, hey, uh, this is a conversation that civil society or common people should not talk, to, talk about. You should only be in government and talk about security and stuff like that. So. Uh, that's the attitude in our part of the world, even if it's other parts of the world too. Um, and later, 20, 2015, uh, uh, 2014, around the same time, there was the Snowden leaks, if you remember, for those, uh, the Snowden times. That's the time when uh, this conversation started becoming more mainstream, the issue about surveillance and data protection and what the government and the citizens are doing. Uh, and at least we got more allies from 2010 to 2011. Back then, you were maybe a lone voice person or two people speaking about a specific issue. You started getting more allies and more people understanding what exactly you have been talking about since 2010. And uh, around the same time uh, when the contract was given, um, 2014, there was a, an amendment to the uh, laws of Kenya whereby the police were given, um, there was, the law was called Security Laws Amendment Act. Uh, which was passed at night. For those who uh, have seen that YouTube video, our MPs fought uh, and even tore each other's clothes in Parliament, which was very, very funny. Uh, but it was very serious. We went to court um, with the Human Rights Commission uh, and uh, Article 19, uh, and we won against that um, attempted amendment at that law, which made, it, uh, made the police bypass judicial authority when surveilling citizens. Basically, any rank of any police officer would surveil you without going through court. While in previous instances, it would be a chief inspector and above. There's those ranks that uh, people have different expertise and you have to go through a judicial uh, authority. So that was struck off as unconstitutional in 2014. And that conversation um, was silent for a while until uh, later this year, uh, early this year and late last year when there was a cyber security law, um, a men, uh, cyber security law that was drafted, which we were part of the committee that um, advised. But then, when it go to the parliament level, uh, the parliament uh, at the last minute, the majority um, MPs uh, changed the clauses and bypassed judicial authority again, similar to whatever we were having in 2014. So we are going back to the same fights that we are having in 2014, the same constitutional fights that we are having. So. Uh, we are back in court for the Cyber Security Law Amendment Act, um, uh, and uh, we will be presenting uh, to, the, to the High Court of Kenya in, in December just about that law. So that's the personal story whereby, uh, for those who, uh, most of us know the 13 principles, we try as much as possible that the necessary and proportionate principles to be adhered to whenever uh, laws are being drafted or policies 
uh, but in our part of the world, sometimes uh, those are opportunities for people to be mischievous and to, to bypass judicial authority and, and to, uh, to create unconstitutional uh, challenges. Sorry, I, I, I have gone too legal, but that's the personal <laughs> story. Yeah, thank you. I find that fascinating because you immediately went into strategies for how to actually fix the problem. So we have one actually power of judiciary and I think you might be able to actually talk to that too at some point because when we discussed that earlier, is the judiciary actually independent everywhere and is that our go-to mechanism or what else do we need to do? Um, before we go there, I have one question on the definition of privacy. I'm, I'm a German citizen and I was actually born on the east side of Berlin. so. For us, I mean, Germans have a reputation for being super fierce about their privacy, but we also remember what it's like to not have any. And even me, I, I was very young when the wall came down, but my family grew up in this system, so there's a trajectory of how you're being raised and why privacy is very important. So I always felt this need for privacy is that space where I'm allowed to think and to form my thoughts, and that's where, like, freedom of expression means nothing if I'm not actually free to retreat within myself to, to think. That's the cultural tradition in Germany of how I would define privacy and why for us it's a human right, but I would be very curious to hear how you reflect that back in your region and in your personal context. So, um, Shishan, do you want to start? So, as I was mentioning before, with the privacy judgment last year, we don't have, um, so what the court did was, we have a constitutional provision which guarantees a right, right to life and liberty. What the court said is that privacy is an integral part to your life and, uh, life and liberty. And it said that um, it emanates from the dignity and integrity of an individual, the autonomy of an individual to make decisions, to be creative, to, be, to, to have free speech. So as I was saying, that, that privacy judgment is a very, gives a very large ambit to, to, to privacy itself. It guarantees bodily privacy, informational privacy, thought privacy. So what we see is that um, that's a very that's a very important uh, definition of privacy back in India. And um, so, I grab something. Well, I can I can say something about it. Not not so much from the legal perspective, but I think in terms of perceptions, um, and especially perceptions related to internet, our perspectives yo-yo a little bit. I think that there were, you know, moments in this trajectory of internet rights, internet politics, where um, we were more concerned with anonymity and privacy and encryption. And at the moment, I feel that there's uh, something starting where people are more concerned about security and more, sec um, more knowledge and transparency about who they're talking to, um, more uh, affirmation <laughs> about where information comes from you know, in, in response to disinformation. And uh, I feel like right now people are extremely confused about how much privacy they want and whether privacy is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, we did a, a public call for proposals for the project that I work on, the Internet Health Report, where we were asking people what are they most concerned about. And every year you can see how people's uh, perception shift and it goes hand in hand, I think, with a lot of the media coverage on this topic. Uh, and this year, we had so many people who were saying, members of the general public who were saying, I want email communication where I can be 100% sure who is sending me the email. I want uh, people to be registered with fingerprints and biometrics so we can be absolutely sure who we're talking to. And that was one half of the responses that we got, and then the other half were, I want more encryption, I want more anonymity, I want more um, safety and freedom of movement on the internet. And so I think we're a little bit at odds about what privacy means, how we value privacy alongside with other things, and how we assess the risks, because frankly, the risks are so great that people don't know what to think or what to do. And that's in every part of the world. We want connectivity, we want people to be connected. It's desperately urgent that societies be connected and that we keep remembering and talking about the positive aspects of life um, with the internet and with online education and all the opportunities. But at the same time, we're also trying to, to find a balance and help decision makers navigate the space without falling into the trap of 
either overly surveying or overly censoring and limiting uh, movement and freedom of thought and speech. I want to quickly add something since you also gave the general uh, understanding of privacy, I gave the legal definition. Um, what we see in India is because how these internet services are designed to be free, a lot of people ask questions that, you know, this really benefits my life, why should I care about privacy? I'm sure they're large corporations, they'll take care of my data, I want to be able to use these services like Google Maps and, and, and you know, so on and so forth. So the general perception might be different on the ground. What I was trying to bring out is the legal definition, at least we have that now. <laughs> okay, so uh, the general perception versus was the legal perception. <laughs> yes, so the general perception uh, generally, because of the laws uh, being close to Somalia, uh, that has been used as a justification to push a narrative that um, we need, every time you're getting into a building, you need to give all your details to leave your ID, not just even for them to verify, but for you to leave your ID, uh, photo ID downstairs in a building or at the entrance, and for you to do your business and for you to get it back once you get out, which is, is used to uh, collect all the data and um, and ask different questions, where are you coming from, who are you going to see, uh, what floor are they. So the general people have gotten used to that kind of invasion, like people don't really question as much. Or for example, like the 2010 time when uh, all your data was in the uh, telco books, all the, all the telcos, it was not just Safaricom, but all the telcos um, w were part of this problem where uh, you, 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 the, the names were there and all the details and that could be used to send you information uh, or to just put you in certain databases that you're not. So the general perception people are, are somehow, somewhat were okay until maybe last year. Uh, last year is when people started questioning further. Uh, uh, there is, um, at the time we had elections last year. We had elections and that time some political candidates sent you messages telling you please come and vote in this specific polling station, please come on this date, like they knew exactly where you are and all that kind of very personal information, it's as if they had triangulated all that. And um, that made people start started questioning, what is this? And right now we are in the process of drafting a data protection law in Kenya. Uh, the version that has been drafted after the public consultation is good, but depends now what happens next when it gets to parliament. Uh, because that's where sometimes things get messed up. Uh, so uh, that's, that's, that's the situation. So th generally we don't have a specific law that protects privacy, but the Constitution has a provision that says privacy should be respected. And there's two court judge judgments which are really, really interesting. Uh, for example, last year the uh, communications regulator requested all telecommunication companies to install a certain device, which they were calling a device management system on their networks. Uh, which the, the purpose was to quote unquote to tell if they are fake phones or um, inauthentic uh, devices in the systems. But then the telcos reached out and said that this device had more capabilities beyond just that. It would uh, be able to look into the text messages, it would be able to look into the calls and, and, and make all those logs. And at the same time, the Kenya Revenue Authority, which is the, revenue, the equivalent to the IRS in, in, in the US, uh, tried or has been trying to, uh, to have this narrative that we need to have all the call records uh, for us to be able to, to get the actual taxation uh, that is required. So taxation is also another argument and some people f uh, would be okay with that but then uh, given the legal situation is only a constitutional provision, uh, it's not, there is no specific law that uh, protects privacy as an, as an act so or a more comprehensive law. So that's what we are working on at the moment, uh, but general perception, no. So um, I'm hearing multiple strands, but basically there's this argument of convenience, like a lot of things run smoother through technology and we do want everyone to be connected and like with the internet of things, other emerging technologies, whether that's voice assistance or virtual reality or whatever other benefits there might be for accessibility and inclusion with new pushes, there's also just discrepancy between are these private actors driving it, which might come with convenience and you can sort of pay for certain protections, or is it the public sector and 
do we still have a choice to opt out if they force us to be part of a certain system, whether that's Atar or some of the Kenyan uh, things that are coming up on financial services. And then if we can't actually exercise our rights as citizens unless we are connected, what does that mean for us pushing back? And I think you mentioned some of this as in you're challenging this in court because you still have a very strong judiciary, but maybe that's the time for you to also talk about the, how the judiciary works in India and how to go about that. So though the I am talking about the privacy judgment, which was this which was this pivotal moment, a um, couple of months back, uh, the Supreme Court of India did legitimize Aadhaar use, and something it's 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 comical what they said that the Aadhaar project utilizes minimal data. I don't know how fingerprint, iris scan, and demographic information is minimal data. So what what we're seeing is that. Um, you know, citizens and civil society organizations, lawyers, they went to the court seeking justice based on privacy, which was already declared a fundamental right and a human right last year. Uh, but we see that the systematic, um, you know, um, non-recognition uh, of, of actual privacy by the judiciary and the executive. Um, and I, I would like to I would like to say that there is this sort of paternalistic attitude of the government in India about, you know, how the government keeps saying data is the new oil. Well, what do you mean by that? Do you mean that you own everything? You you own our data, and w what we're seeing is that this paternalistic a attitude is seeping into debates around technology, you know, whether it's AI or data protection. We do have a, a draft data protection law. Um, and it talks about, uh, uh, we call it data localization, which basically means that the government wants to keep certain data on servers only in India, and they have the, uh, they have the prerogative to say what data this will be, and um, most civil society organizations have been, have been up in arms saying that, you know, this is not fair for the open web and the open internet, uh, but just trying, to, just trying to illustrate the point that where this paternalistic attitude is coming from through the Aadhaar project. The government also brought in uh, a draft program of social media hub, which was basically monitoring of social media. So monitoring of everyone's activity, the entire country's activity on social media, it was quickly scrapped off when challenged in court. But um, yeah, so we, we've been seeing this paternalistic attitude. Another point which I want to mention about, mention about the luxury of um, you know, disconnecting, um, it's not just on the, on the software side of things, you know, there, 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 there has been information that a lot of manufacturers, Chinese manufacturers have, you know, have, have inserted some, some, you know, hardware, some, some surveillance mechanisms in their chips, in the hardware chips they use. And so coming back to the point that is, can we, can we protect our privacy? So. But I think this kind of uh, paternalistic attitude, if, if you wanted to call it that, I mean, I think you see elements of it in the commercial software industry as well, where they've created this expectation that absolutely everything you do at any time of day should be recorded and should be known by corporate actors who then have access to your data in order to, to make money. I mean, uh, I try never to say data is the new oil, uh, but, but it has become shorthand for um, what people understand as the commercialization of data. So that people have tracking devices to track what time of day they sleep and for how long and whether they dream. Um, that children have software in schools that shows how quickly they learn and how well they do in math and that that data is also combined uh, with data about what we purchase and who we're friends with and who we talk to and what our uh, fantasies are if we use online dating software, those kinds of things. Um, this expectation of being tracked and monitored all the time exists both in the uh, corporate sector and in the government sector. And uh, I think it's something that we should be pushing back against and creating spaces where we are disconnected. I mean, whether it's that, uh, you know, the, the, the gap years that some teenagers are able to take after they finish high school, maybe it needs to be a technological gap year <laughs> where they're disconnected from the internet and email and all that comes with it. Um, that would be like a, a social thing to, to try, but how do, we, how do we as civil society and also as software engineers and um, government representatives, how do we create those spaces where you can really be 
offline when you choose to be. I, I don't think that we have that opportunity at the moment at all. That was exactly my prompt for the next question. What do we actually do? Because uh, that's, that's perfectly right, right? The, the narratives are so powerful, so strong. And even if you look at, like I, I just remembered the side lab uh, in Toronto, the smart city concept. If you just read the way it's advertised, it's an amazing craft of storytelling, right? It sounds beautiful and quite utopian, but then the implementation has, for very good reasons, received quite a bit of pushback, right? So there's a question of how do you challenge these large apparatus of powerful storytelling that keep selling us these sci-fi visions of where to go, right? So. I mean, maybe one way, and that's, that, that would be the angle that I'd be interested to hear what others have to say, but working on, in policy, it's a lot about narrative. So if I look at current sci-fi literature, it's all dystopian, it's all dark. It's like 1984, but 10 levels up, right? Any, anything on Black Mirror is really dark and bleak, and oh my gosh, those robot dots already exist. It's really terrible, but like, why is that? Why do we not actually sell utopias? Why don't we imagine a future that's better and then try to backstep what do we actually need to do because that makes it easier for us to define action to say this, to, in order to get there to something that's more positive, this is what we need to do now. Like you can, that's strategic foresight, how to get there. But imagining these utopias is a lot harder if our mechanisms are on top of your 20 days of vacation every year, you now have 10 days of vacation where you actually get to be offline. It's a strategy, but is that the only strategy we have? Um, Efren, do you want to start? Yes. Uh, for, for me, my part of the world has been, and, and I, I mentioned this uh, partly in my previous uh, intervention, the building of allies. Because sometimes you just need to make people care because maybe they don't have that nudge, because maybe they're not aware. Maybe you're the person around in your neighborhood who maybe is aware about some of these things. So that is the first step, uh, especially in my part of the world, where even, even among lawyers, not everybody understands technology and the law specifically. Like you are very few, you know each other, all of you, but you need more allies so that it's not just you yourself always um, going to court about those issues or yourself only doing that. So build the building of allies is the, 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 for, for me the most important uh, intervention and not sometimes in some parts of the world where we work in such as Uganda or Tanzania for example uh, where uh, I'm sure some of you might have read in the news uh, some of community, community to protect journalists um, uh, were arrested some allies uh, some places like those you don't have to really rely always only on the judiciary you have to figure out um, other me mechanisms such as international pressure and stuff like that. So that ki kind of international solidarity is very also important to maybe also push some countries' norms whenever a country is proposing laws which are not really nice, for example. And I'll, and I'll just give a shout out to David Kay. David Kay has been very supportive in our work. He's David Kay, the special rapporteur for uh, freedom of expression uh, and information. He's been very supportive in our work. He's written to governments sometimes. Um, urging them to pass laws uh, in a way that respects human rights uh, and respects um, individual uh, rights. Uh, so building that international pressure, and for example, this week, David Kay, writing to the Tanzanian government, among other interventions, the African Union Special Rapporteur, those are some of the allies and, and the, the, the networks that um, have been very, very supportive to our work. Um, and, and, and that has been our strategy beyond just going to court because there are some places that I've mentioned. We work in 14 countries in Eastern Africa. Some places the rule of law doesn't fully exist or some places it's when it's being built or some places some new communities are being formed such as in Ethiopia under the new prime minister. Uh, so building, taking onto those networks and, and, and trying to, to build new allies and taking advantage of such opportunities such as the current political transition happening in Ethiopia, for example. So I do hear elements of what's your source of trust as an individual networks, ally networks that help us understand because it's, I, I feel like from what you're saying, it's also part of the problem that people don't know where to start, right? So who do you trust to identify what's a good way forward, sort of? 
Yeah, sure. Like, I'm, I'm still, like, you can raise your hand anytime you want to jump in. It's, uh, I, I'm basically waiting for that. I, w I would love to hear if there are any reflections um, in the audience uh, work that's similar or sh um, Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, this has been a really great panel so far. Uh, I've just got, uh, I think. Would you mind briefly saying who sure. you are and where you're from? Sure, I'm from, I'm Blaine Haggart. I'm from, uh, from Brock University in Canada. Um, right down the road from Sidewalk Labs, or, or from Waterfront Toronto, I guess. Um, and my question is kind of, uh, uh, has to do a little bit with that. It has, uh, and I was interested to hear uh, the gentleman uh, talking about India and data localization, because uh, as being kind of uh, being hugely controversial, because uh, especially around the, the Sidewalk Labs Waterfront Toronto project, um, data localization has been proposed as a way actually to, for, for, for I guess, Torontonians to have some control over their over their privacy. So I was I was interesting. Is this a, just a kind of a uh, situation where um, different political battles equals kind of different approaches to uh, what is the same issue? Like, can data localization be a useful thing uh, to happen in this context? And also in terms of uh, thinking about the different kinds of how to how to deal with privacy, um, you know, is one of the answers essentially maybe outlawing certain types of data collection. Uh, this again has come up in the uh, in the Sidewalk Labs Waterfront Toronto issue, and um, and then there's also the issue of whether or not s certain um, types of data just shouldn't be uh, commodified or traded I in the first place, and maybe some business models should not be allowed to exist. I mean, um, you know, we're in a kind of a knowledge-driven society, um, but you know, for the past several hundred years, people themselves have been commodified in a market society, but we put limits on that. So is that kind of the answer there, essentially, is limit, limit the marketplace in, uh, in data? Uh, yes, thank you very much. This is really inspirational. Uh, my name is Tat Tant. I'm from Myanmar. Uh, we give a lot of uh, digital literacy training in Myanmar through our library network. And we found out that uh, Myanmar is just recently, we're getting a lot of the uh, mobile penetrations. It's jumped from like 12% in 2012 to 80 percent in to this year. So this is a big jump, but people, critical thinking skills are still low, so we have to do a lot of training. So privacy is a, one of the main uh, issues that we are facing. So people used to put everything on, on Facebook, like uh, your eating style, everything. So your data are all, all get it by this uh, company. Sometimes even like uh, some of the houses are uh, robbed because they put it online that, you know, the whole family is gone, one, there's nothing left. So this type of thing happens. So we develop a curriculum together with the University of Washington on the, uh, we call it mobile information literacy uh, curriculum, and it has been doing very well. I just want to ask, you know, what sort of uh, uh, mechanism works to uh, reach more, you know, in, in other countries like uh, Kenya or other countries? Like, we've been doing a lot with the uh, community libraries, but what about formal, way of education, you know, like schools or these type of things. Do you have any experience or not? Thank you. Hi, my name is Belen Jimenez. I am from Paraguay, South America. I am a youth at IGF fellow uh, from Internet Society, and I'm also a cyber psychologist. So basically, I analyze how technology has an impact on our behavior. So uh, my question goes more towards uh, connectivity and like uh, on the youth and children, especially on the dynamics of sharenting, which is when, when, for example, parents share content of their children, like pictures, videos, almost every day, almost compul compulsively sometimes in social media. And I was interested in uh, knowing, uh, like in these cases, uh, what is your opinion about this, especially since there's an ongoing debate uh, about balancing the parents' right to like, express themselves and to share content, but also uh, the children's right uh, to privacy. Very great question. We have more questions coming up. Let us take those three before we take the next two that are already raising up. So, Do you want to start? OK, so on uh, data localization, um, the, gov the government says that if you keep your data in India, it will be more secure. Um, there are no historical records of, you know, 
illustrating that. <laughs> and um, so what, what we feel is as civil society, data localization will, because India doesn't have strong surveillance, anti-surveillance laws, data localization might lead to um, higher surveillance. Um, it'll, it'll, what some researchers call, it'll create a honeypot situation where if a lot of sensitive data gets concentrated in India and it only resides there and we don't have, we don't have encryption laws, encryption standards, um, we don't have um, anti-surveillance laws, what will happen is it'll be easier for hackers to access this data. So we're definitely against data localization and, and I can say more or less all civil society organizations, most of them are trying to push the government not to include this. Um, on, um, on the point about um, child rights, that's, that's something which I was talking to even, um, you know, um, e even the panel before, that, um, you know, we, we need to balance a children's right to privacy also with the children's right to, um, to information. Correct, correct me if, if any of you feel differently or if the audience feels differently. If, so uh, in our data protection draft law in India, there's a strong um, parental consent mechanism without which children will not have um, legal access to a lot of online, online content. Um, I feel this is slightly problematic where we are defining the age of a child to be 18 years and, and, and below. So, you know, that's, that's a very high threshold in, in, in the way children are, children are growing up and at, at, at what age they're getting access to the internet. So, um, that's something I would just, you know, um, like to, like to uh, mention. Uh, another thing which I would like to say is that definitely education and formal education, there, sh there needs to be a curriculum today on digital literacy. A lot of um, people are interacting with new technologies who are not, who don't even have basic literacy. So at least we should start at a point where education and curriculums for children, and I've, I've worked in ed policy and I, I, I see that um, how, how children benefit from learning using making use of the internet especially in, in a country like India where we don't necessarily have good good teachers and good good schools so the internet you know the, it 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 bec becomes this bridge to the good quality education but um, you know having said that the, um, we need to again balance the, ch the right of the child to privacy and the right of the child to information I'm very happy that you brought up the, the point of, of sharing thing. Um, it's, it's a topic that I discuss with friends and family as well. I don't share images of my daughter online, and I have some friends who do, but the vast majority, even people who work in privacy and digital rights, do it. And it's a very awkward topic to bring up because you can't tell people how to parent. <laughs> um, and I think it's one where we've definitely overlooked the rights of the child and the best interests of the child. People do not want photos of themselves sitting on the toilet available for everybody in the whole world to see. Um, and I, I think there has been at least one court case of a child suing parents that I've seen, and I believe it was in France, it was uh, a couple of years ago. And I believe that we're going to see many, many, many more uh, types of these kinds of uh, backlash of children coming of age and being horrified by what their parents have posted online. Not even just photos and videos, but also text describing what they've said or, or how they've behaved as young children. I think it's a, a, an area that's uh, really ready for um, better regulatory guidelines um, and protections of, of children. In terms of libraries, uh, I've seen many people this year especially, uh, I've heard so many reports of libraries really becoming an important part of um, digital education and digital security training. Mozilla, our organization, has also been working with um, New York City government on doing digital security training in New York City public libraries. Um, it's an area where libraries, I think, are very much showing up as um, helping people navigate both how they use technology but how they stay safe on, online. Um, and I hope that trend continues uh, all over the world. And adding to these points on, on the children, I think there's a cultural awareness that I mean, we, we can't forget that the social media sharing is 10 years old, right? So we're still getting used to the norms. So what I notice in my surroundings is that people are only starting to, even as adults, request that please do not share that picture unless you ask me whether I'm actually okay with this picture because you just share whatever. Mm -hmm. But having a group photo and making sure that everyone actually consents 
to the scriptura being shared is not a social norm yet. And if we haven't even reached that as adults, consenting adults to say that, then this parenting chase, that at least we have, because children are vulnerable once they come of age and can start suing, mm -hmm. we will see that. And it's gonna happen rather soon because they are just about to come out of age. And social media right. is just part of it because now yeah. we all have listening devices yes. soon in our homes. Yeah. Um, or telephones that we can talk to and that listen to us in some capacity or not. And so um, a colleague of mine, he also, he always makes the analogy that now there's a social convention, you don't smoke in somebody's home or you take your shoes off before you go into somebody's home. But if somebody has an Amazon uh, Echo or a Google machine that listens, what are the conventions for when somebody comes into your home? Do you tell them that you have a microphone <laughs> that is listening to them all the time? Do you ask for them to turn it off when you walk in? How, how do you navigate this kind of online, all the time um, relationship to technology? And children, I think, are at risk here as well, uh, where they may say things or do things that may be embarrassing to them uh, when they're grown-ups. Um, absolutely, and there's also the, like we, we're actually, why, because we're talking about what we can really do to change that, also social norms like that. So. I was just thinking of a film festival, the Rooftop Film Festival. They had just dedicated during their summer festival a whole series to data usage. And there were some of them exactly like that. What is dating behavior? Do I actually, in a blind date, one of my first questions is, do you own an Alexa or a Siri or whatever? Because if you do, maybe I don't want to go home with you because I have a different <laughs> understanding of privacy, right? Yes. So like, you got to challenge this in some way in art and movies and satire are good ways to try and make something tangible that seems strange because we need to question our societal impact. And I think libraries are great because libraries are use, usually places for quiet, right? So learning to reflect and to think about what you want to do is, is something to definitely go forward. Um, the DQ Institute, for instance, is something that they work a lot in the whole Asia region. They're based in Korea and Singapore. And I do think they have resources working with uh, the Association of Libraries also. So they might be helpful for you to go there. For data localization, I just wanted to add one more thing. Um, there's also the business aspect of this. If data needs to be localized, you're also harming the market because it's actually very expensive to have servers everywhere around the world. So there's this question of when do already vulnerable or weaker markets being left out because the big companies only choose those that actually have the market power to also finance their services. So outside of security risks, there's something to be considered there. And maybe a better way of thinking about this is what do I as an individual maybe own on my particular device so that I can take control with my device, but I can take it with me and it's not stored to whatever region, it's not confined by national borders, but I own it and I'm the only one who control what to share with it. So there are blockchain technologies to go about this. There are some, a lot of downsides to blockchain because of our electricity and whatever needs. But there are ways that we haven't explored yet to make it more individual and less regionally based. And you, I think, wanted to jump in on. Yeah. And there, yes. there are still questions, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, so, um, just uh, to build on to the, on, on to, on to the previous interventions, uh, in Kenya we are coming up, uh, and this is the same thing also with Rwanda, uh, where the government has this one laptop per child project, whereby students are supposed to have laptops from as young as grade, um, uh, what grade, uh, um, class one, which is the equivalent around age six, age seven. Uh, so each student is supposed, so all the, the laptops have uh, all the educational content and stuff like that. So this is a project which has done very well in Rwanda, but Kenya is still picking the, up that. But then one thing that has been missing in that project, uh, which is funded by some of the funding partners in uh, this space, uh, has, has been the building of privacy, teaching them as part of the curricula. So just, you're getting this device, you're being told, hey, get on the computer. Um, the computers are mostly not connected to the internet, but then they have all this information uh, already pre-downloaded to them. Uh, but uh, something that, that I think that would be a good intervention, and something which we've been thinking about, uh, trying to plug into existing mechanisms, not to start something afresh. And another intervention that has been working a bit is the Safer Internet Day. I don't know if some of you are aware about Safer Internet Day. Sometime in, I think, March every year. Uh, sorry? February 5th, <laughs> yes, February 5th. I've spoken at a number of Safer Internet Days, and um, over the years, uh, we've gotten high-level uh, 
participation uh, for, from the various governments. This year we had the uh, president sent uh, the um, cabinet secretary, uh, Rafael Tuju, to come and, and, and attend and speak to these young people about it. So uh, over the years, we're trying to get high level uh, attention to these issues uh, through the Safer Internet Day and um, through uh, partnering with uh, with uh, various institutions. So that's something which maybe we need to, b to plug into those initiatives. And given Safer Internet Day is like a global, already a global movement, we need to maybe support those kind of uh, mechanisms out there and for more awareness. And just I with a caution that it shouldn't be fear mongering, it should be responsible use of technology and, and not fear mongering because that's, that is a risk sometimes that happens where you tell people, no, don't connect to the internet, don't don't post anything, like just trying to, uh, moving from fear mongering to responsible use, that would be a good, good step and good interventions. We're running out of time. We have three more allocated minutes. So let's just collect your questions and we can try to at least each give a 30 second pitch. So why don't you start, please? Hi, um, my name is Ilya Hosanian at KU Leuven University. First of all, thank you very much for uh, an exciting discussion. Um, I've heard a lot of case-specific issues or uh, context-specific experiences, things that are obviously very important and uh, are practical in nature. Um, and they're also often instrumentally framed, often dic dichotomous in nature, you know, market versus state me versus you, us versus them. And uh, since we're nearing the end of, uh, of today's discussion, I would like to ask a question that doesn't just pertain to existing problems, but perhaps future problems, and are a bit more philosophical in nature. My question pertains to what does this all mean for being a human, ontologically speaking, or rather remaining human? My generation went from being sometimes relatively uh, excluded from quote-unquote inclusion because of financial reasons or simply technological limitations. Nowadays, I ask myself the question, do we and will we even have the right to be excluded from these things? If uh, we think it's normal to allocate weekly time for meditation these days or uh, go to yoga classes, uh, will we perhaps in the future be forced or compelled to allocate some time uh, to enter a, a room or an area just to be disconnected from rampant connectivity and 5G uh, just to be able to remain human or not? And, uh, yeah, thank you. That was my question. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Masayuki from Japan. Um, I'm involved with the uh, development of privacy, en privacy enhancing technologies, including TOA or I2P. So my question is, uh, um, this session was built as a right to disconnect, but uh, from my, my viewpoint, I think we are talking about a right not to be categorized. And uh, I believe this is a right, a very important right, but I'm not sure, um, um, as a people, you, you think uh, this right not to be categorized is kind of one of human rights. So I really ask about that. Um, and also, I think opting out, opt out, uh, this categorization is very difficult. So my own strategy is making sure, creating a new identity, new vanilla identity to, you know, use uh, to use online activities. So I, I think it's, this, it's kind of easier to achieve. So I appreciate your uh, comment on this strategy. Thank you very much. We, like the next session is already lining up here. So if you can keep it to 10 seconds and then we need to actually take our answers outside so that we're not blocking the next session from coming on. Hi, uh, my name is Carlton Samuels. I'm from uh, the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. I wanted to ask the panel if they're uh, ready to look at uh, situations where there are competing rights, and especially in the area 
of uh, child protection and cyber security. What we see in the region is a host of cyber security laws framed in protecting children, but at the same time trespassing on other rights. We, for example, the categorization of what a child is. For example, an 18-year-old as a child involves sometimes at the university where you're teaching, then a certain content cannot be made available, and that then uh, decimates the rights of others. So I wanted to hear your uh, reflection on that. Thanks. Mike has already switched off. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid we don't have time to answer because we really need to move on, but we can meet right at the door to answer those last questions because they were all really good and very interesting, and I'm so sorry that not everyone got to speak. Thank you for joining, and uh, let's continue the conversation outside.